su paz. Un barro con casco con la pisa patea el fiasco. Provocar un social terremoto en este chat. Del cielo al suelo y del suelo al cielo vamos. So, 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 so. Nos dices que debemos sentarnos, pero las ideas solo pueden levantarnos, caminar, recorrer, no rendirse ni retroceder, ver, aprender como esponja, absorbe, nadie sobre todos, faltan todos, suman todos, para todos, todo para nosotros, soñamos en grande que se caiga el imperio, lo gritamos algo, no queda más remedio, esto no es utopía, es alegre rebeldía del baile de los que sobran de la danza que me mía, levantarnos para decir ya va. Social terremoto en este chat.
So I want to welcome folks. I think we can, we can maybe start to make that cue to get started. So thank you for the music, the sound. Um, but I want to get it started just to kind of respect everyone's time. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. I want to I want to welcome everyone to USF School of Education Center for Humanizing Education Research discussion this evening: Human Learning and Educational Justice in Times of Empire. Um, a conversation with Dr. Shireen Wasugi and Dr. Uh, Sapir Vikhil. So I am David Felix San. I'm an assistant professor of teacher education at the University of San Francisco and affiliated faculty with the Center for uh, Humanizing Education and, and Research, or CHER, as we call it. I will be helping to host tonight, and I want to extend first just gratitude to everyone joining us across wherever you're dialing in, um, across the various interwebs. When you get a chance, perhaps just maybe locate our chat and drop your name and where you're dialing in from, including if you have any relationship to uh, our university, to the School of Education. I'm hoping we have just some good representation across the many departments of the SOE and perhaps the broader campus. But just maybe take a second to locate our chat and just uh, and just drop that in. Okay. So tonight's event continues a series of public facing events sponsored by CHER, including engineering violence, school closing, public housing, law enforcement, and the future of black life with Professor David Stovall and myself. We seem to have some good energy with Chicago folks um, as we have them represented today. Um, secondly, punish for dreaming how school reform harms black children and how we heal between Professor Bettina Love and our esteemed faculty, Farima Poor Korshid. And uh, over the past couple of years, CHER has also helped to organize a series of internal projects, which have culminated in our forthcoming TC Press book, Crafting Home Place in the Academic Borderlands, Humanizing Education, Research, and Relationships, of which Professor Kuhn, myself, and IME faculty, Emma Fuentes, are co-editors and authors, in collaboration, of course, with many SOE colleagues that are hopefully dialed in with us today. So Crafting Home Place highlights the many individual, but also collective educational projects of SOE faculty, both within and beyond our institution, including various freedom dreaming projects, but also freedom striving projects to create a more humanizing space within our School of Education, of which ultimately the center see her derives from and continues. And so the Center for Humanizing Education Research is part of that ongoing praxis. And so our conversation uh, this evening with Professor Shireen and Saper is just a, a humble offering to create pockets for uh, the transformative, uh, transformational reflection and action that we consider to be important world making. So we want to thank um, our SOE leadership, particularly Dean Shabnam Karel Azad, for her model and practice of leadership and service to help to create these types of spaces and these affirmation efforts. So many thanks to the various university departments that have helped to make this conversation happen tonight, including Lena Onishi and her many works across the SOE and our Center for Humanizing Education Research, um, and Professor Sine Chung um, and uh, her consistent guidance within CHER. So thank you all for being here tonight um, for our conversation, Human Learning and Educational Justice in Times of Empire. And so just some, some brief logistics before we introduce our speakers. We will have the chat open and publicly visible. So everyone, please chime in as you're inspired. So when the church needs to say amen, just do what you do. Um, but for our actual questions for our speakers, um, as they happen in real time or at the conclusion of this conversation, please use the Q&A icon, which looks like the chat, but it, but won't be publicly visible during the conversation. OK, so we'll try to curate your questions during the event and highlight some of them during our allotted Q&A time, which will happen afterwards, um, of which then we want to continue to, you know, of course, continue using the Q&A. Um, chat for that. Okay. All right. So now on to the introduction of our speakers, um, Drs. Shreen Usugi and Saper Vakil, two esteemed scholars, colleagues, and friends of ours who have been so gracious with their time, um, given this central standard two hour ahead um, that we know is, is definitely uh, child family prime time. So we're really gracious just to have you all and, um, and look forward to just learning um, from you and with you. So Shireen Vusugi is an educator, mama writer, and associate professor of learning sciences at Northwestern, where she studies the cultural, social, political, and ethical dimensions of human learning. Um, her research centers on the tensions 
and possibilities of political education and the conditions that support educational dignity and imagination. She works collaboratively with teachers, students, and families to design and study learning environments that both support young people to develop, question, and expand disciplinary and artistic knowledge in ways that nourish educational self-determination. She's particularly, particularly concerned with understanding the forms of pedag pedagogical uh, mediation, ethical relations, and development that take shape through the everyday language, work, and moment-to-moment -moment interaction within these settings. So thank you so much for being here. Sapir Vakil is an Associate Professor of Learning Sciences also in the School of Education and Social Policy at Northwestern University and the Faculty Director of the Technology, Race, Ethics, and Equity in Education, or TREE Lab. He received his PhD from UC Berkeley in education and engineering degrees from UCLA. And in terms of his relationship more closely with us in, in 2015 and 2016, he was a Geraldo Moran dissertation fellow where he spent time in our teacher education department, as well as the international and multicultural education programs. He is interested in STEM education, computer science and engin engineering education, technology ethics and policy, politics of educational equity and justice, cultural processes and learning, global and international STEM and engineering education, and is broadly interested in the role of culture, identity, emotion, humor, storytelling, and creativity in learning and development. He is also the author of a forthcoming book called Revolutionary Engineers from MIT Press, spring of 2025, about various radical radical engineers in Iran in the years leading up to the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Okay, so thank you, Sapir. And to help curate this conversation, we're, we'll have our own Professor Don Fung Soto, Soto Vigil Kuhn. Uh, professor Kuhn is an associate professor in the Leadership Studies Department in the School of Education, is also faculty co-director of the Transformative School Leadership Program, and like myself, a key faculty member affiliated with the Center for Humanizing Education and Research. Her research focuses on educational law and policy as a site of contestation and explores the ways that educational law and policy further or impede efforts to create a more just society. These passions and commitments to public education are informed by her work as an educator, a lawyer, and organizer. Okay. So uh, everyone, Shireen, Sapir, thank you all again for your offerings, for your time, for our uh, community today. And thank you, Don Fung, for helping us to get started in our conversation. So I'll pass it to you. Great. Thank you, David. So tonight, we're really excited to bring together three big topics. So human learning, educational justice, and empire. These ideas are not often in the same space together. And we're here to both explore what that might be, why that might be, and how a conversation that brings them together might reshape our work as educators, researchers, community members, and parents. In general, I would say in education, we spend much more time thinking about the first two concepts, right? So human learning and educational justice than we do empire. This is not surprising in many ways since we live in the dominant empire of our age and like other forms of privilege, our own privilege position is often not so clear to us. So just to spend a little time before we launch into the conversation, I wanted to take some more explicit, make more explicit our everyday connections to empire. So I thought of four and I'm sure there are more, but I'm just gonna share the four that I came up with. So first, right, empire is what brought most of us to this land. Conquest, enslavement, colonialism, war, forced or voluntary migration are all projects of empire. So in other words, we would not be here if not for empire. Second, empire is what brings many of our students to our classrooms and new communities into our neighborhoods, either as political or economic refugees. So who we serve and who we are in community with is often shaped by empire. Third, the military and defense industry takes up about 20 to 25% of our national budget. So each of us literally are paying for the maintenance of empire through our taxes taken from our paychecks from January 1st to something like the end of March. So that's around now. So we are individually and collectively funding empire, whether we believe in its actions or not. 
And most of our conversations about equity and justice in this country are often had within an assumption that we don't have enough abundance to provide a good life for everyone. And this is simply not true. Finally, we are all current beneficiaries of empire. Our standard of living, the strength of the dollar, our ability to travel, the primacy of the English language are made possible because of the maintenance of American military and cultural dominance. So meaning every day we are benefiting from empire. So for me, bringing together these topics is one of the most urgent things we need to do as educators, not because empire is a new thing, right? It's been here for a long time, but because we are at a crossroads now. Empire building has led us to a moment in time when our existence as a species and as a planet is at stake. So what's more, empire itself is in crisis. So people who have benefited from empire are in crisis, which leads to all types of violence that we're seeing today. We see this in the lashing out, the renewed wars of conquest abroad, the ramping up of policing, prisons, and surveillance here, and all the crazy cultural backlash and censorship of anyone questioning empire in our schools, universities, or media. But the amazing thing is that we currently also have vibrant communities, alternative spaces, ways to communicate and network across the globe, and the ability to feed and sustain every life on earth. So we have real choices in the coming decades, right? These are questions that I put to my own children. The question for me now is how do we as individuals and collectives come to understand the choice between justice and empire? And what is the role of education and educators in this process? So tonight we have the great privilege of hearing from Shireen and Sapir, who have been thinking about the intersection of these three big ideas, human learning, educational justice and empire for years. They've talked about it. It sounds like they've been talking about it at their child's preschool or something like that. So they've been talking about this just, you know, kind of interpersonally. And so we are really excited to hear from them today. Um, to guide our conversation, David and I um, will just pose questions. We'll take turns posing questions. And then again, if you have any questions that you um, want to ask, drop in the Q&A and we will raise them at the end. All right, are you ready to jump in? Okay. So the first question for all, for both of you is, you know, your titles are learning scientists. And a lot of people might think of people in lab coats that are like pricking and prodding you, or, you know, they have a certain image of what that means. So tell us about the ways that you've reclaimed learning science and its meaning and how this understanding is informed by your personal and political histories. And either of you, whoever wants to start. That's the irony gesture of go go ahead. So I'll take that. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. Um, thank you to David and Dong Fung for having us um, to USF and to everybody who's here tonight. Um, I see some grad school homies in the audience too. So um, thank you everybody for being here. It's also an honor to have this conversation with all of you and with my brother, Seper. Um, we actually share, we're like next door, our offices are next door. <laughs> so uh, we talk a lot um, and we've had a longstanding kind of friendship and intellectual conversation, which I've always really appreciated. And, and I say that because it's also a special treat to get to have this conversation together with all of you. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I'm gonna just jump in and um, and I'm excited to kind of wrap with you about this part, Seper, but um, I, I feel like I can't um, explain kind of what brought me to the study of learning and to being an educator without sharing a little bit about my family history. And I think it's connected to those layers of empire that you spoke to. Um, Dong Feng when we started. So I, I um, want to start there and um, start with my dad, actually. So I'm actually visiting my brother um, in his house on the West Coast. So I'm on the same time as you all. And um, I found this picture of my dad <laughs> when he was a kid. Um, and that's actually a relevant part of the story from where this starts. So he's no longer with us, but his name was Majid Boussouri. And um, he grew up in the Northwest of Iran in a town called Ardabil. Um, and he um, was living in poverty with his family um, as a young person in the 1930s, 1940s, um, and worked um, kind of difficult jobs as a child. Um, and around the age of 11, wrote an essay in school um, critiquing poverty and injustice. And um, members of the Tudeh Party, which was a kind of widespread communist party in Iran at the time, recruited him 
to kind of join their efforts. And he became an activist at the age of 11 um, through this essay. And so um, that history has been really important to my own experience. And I'll tell you a little bit about why. Um, one of the ways that empire manifested in Iran at the time was through um, the kind of British control of US oil. So, or British and US control of Iranian oil. So my dad used to always joke like, how did their oil get under our land? Um, was one of the things he used to say. Um, and so when he was 18, um, there was a um, nationalist leader named Mohammad Mossadegh who attempted to nationalize Iranian oil um, as part of kind of anti-imperialist movements around the world and nationalizing resources. And um, <clears throat> the US and Great Britain um, uh, took out this democratically elected leader um, and subsequently began to imprison. Um, they had already been imprisoning, but intensified the kind of imprisonment and torture of many of the people on the left, including my dad. Um, and so uh, between that time, 1953 and 1979, there was kind of a gathering movement um, against the US um, control of, of Iranian kind of political sovereignty um, and for a kind of democratic and egalitarian system that my father was a part of, um, which succeeded in 1979, which is the revolution that David alluded to. Um, and that revolution succeeded in getting rid of the Shah, which was a US-backed dictator, um, and pretty quickly um, reinstated its own forms of kind of repression and control. And so the reason I'm here speaking English with you, the reason that my family was displaced is because many of the people on the left in that context were also um, persecuted, executed, and displaced by a revolution that they supported. And so that history has always been really important to my own understanding of social and political change and what it requires. And I think for me, it taught me that um, it requires more than a shift in state power and it requires more than knowing what we're against. Um, and, and part of the lesson that I took from that revolution is that we have to know what we're building, we have to um, understand what we're after creating, and that revolution is also, or you know, bigger kind of macro level transformative change is a process, should be a process of human learning, learning how to be with each other differently, learning how to create systems that are not, where the prisons aren't full, um, and and creating a different kind of um, life-giving system and possibility. And I think for me, that's a relational change. It's not just a political change. It's people learning how to relate with each other differently, which has always felt to me like a process of learning. Um, and so I, I kind of grew up in a household with that history in a way that um, left me wondering about how um, bigger forms of political change can happen that don't reproduce those structures of power um, and don't reproduce kind of like horizontal forms of violence, which we've not only seen in Iran, but seen around the world in human history in different forms. Um, and the other piece of this story is that I always liked kids. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of bringing it back to children and young people, like ever since I was 11 or 12, I um, knew that I wanted to work with children in some way. I thought children were um, brilliant, um, really interesting, hilarious, amazing human beings. And, um, and, I, and I had no idea as a young person how to bring these worlds together, how to bring together these bigger kind of political and critical questions about global inequality and injustice with, with a love of working with children. Um, and it wasn't until I found, and, I'll, and I can share a little bit more about that, um, I'll pass it to Sepper in a second, but it wasn't an, until I found um, a set of educators who are working in the study of human learning, um, and not only the study of it, but the design of kind of expansive forms of political education, um, that I could see how to bring these kinds of interests um, and different scales of trying to understand change together. Um, so there's more to say about that, but I'll pass it to Sepper. Um, and kind of go back and forth a little bit on that. Hi, uh, thank you, Shanine. Um, wow, there's so this has already been very rich. So just want to start with a few things. Um, first of all, beginning with gratitude to to David, to Don Fong, to USF. Um, it, it does feel special to kind of be in conversation uh, with you all, having having spent um, uh, a significant amount of time and really learning from from the space. So I'm, so I'm honored to be invited back. And this series in particular, I've heard a lot about it and on uh, the space that you all are creating. Um, it's an honor, you know, given the names that you mentioned, David, people who've been in conversation here, it's an honor to be, to be uh, connected and a part of that. Um, I also want to emphasize 
I'm just kind of observing in the moment how important it is, how unique it is to have a conversation about empire and a little bit of history about that actually um, brings Shirin and I's story together. So, so I did my graduate work uh, at Berkeley with David um, and I remember, and I always like to make sure I, you know, give um, flowers to different mentors and professors who really kind of open pathways. And so <clears throat> there was a particular guest lecture we had, Danny Martin from UIC, scholar of uh, race, uh, race and mathematics education. Um, he was giving a talk on the relationship between white supremacy and, and math education broadly. And I remember for, for a period of time, I was starting, you know, I was a grad student. My mind was a little bit all over the place. And I, and I had started to wonder about, like, we, we talk a lot about different ideologies and structures related to, to race. And it, at Berkeley, that was a big focus of what we were, we were doing. A lot, we had a lot of expertise in terms of the professors there, um, many people who mentored, you know, David and I. Um, but this question of empire was, was if, you know, at best, backgrounded. And I was, I was, um, I kind of nervously raised my hand in Q and A and asked Danny Martin. I didn't know him, you know, if if in the specific area of math education, thinking about the the political history of the math wars and the role of the Cold War and the different forces that have pushed and pulled on mathematics education as a body, if there's a room or a need to also consider foreign policy questions of U.S. militarism, and he affirmed me like in the moment, right off the bat, without thinking, he affirmed me, and it just. It was just a signal. And then, you know, I think it was a universe really aligning itself because around the same time, another friend of ours, Maxine McKinney Royston, was like, you need to meet Shirin because you guys are both Iranian and you do cool work. Let me introduce you. So I met Shirin and she threw a great party in San Francisco. Um, and from there, you know, she was a postdoc and she reached out to me and said, hey, I think we're on the same page on a lot of topics. And she invited me to come and, and write a, a chapter with her uh, about the role of U.S. militarism in STEM education. And it felt like we were doing something subversive because we were and doing something different and additive to the equity conversation in, in STEM education because we were. And 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 to now fast forward however, however many years <laughs> ago that was, and we're having a conversation about that is super critical with the backdrop of the world as it is, right, with what's happening in Gaza What's, 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 what's happening in Ukraine, what's, what's happening with respect to the political landscape where, where, where you have people who are voting for Trump now on an anti-war, trumped up and anti-war sort of uh, argument. So to think about the relationship between empire and education, I think is, is, has always been critical. Um, but in this moment, it feels especially, especially relevant. Um, so I want to follow on Shireen's steps a little bit in terms of tracing like how I got into the learning sciences. You know, for me, it starts with my family as well. So I was born in, in Iran. Um, and my story is that my parents were not activists in, in the way that Shirin's father, and I love hearing every time you talk about your dad, Shirin, thank you for sharing that history. Um, so my parents were adjacent to the revolution. They were, they were part of it, they were part of the student movements. Um, my dad came to the US before the revolution for grad school. The revolution happened. He kind of dropped grad school and went back to Iran to become a high school math teacher, very much to join the revolution, to be a part of a new generation, post-revolution generation of Iranians. And his his uh, lens was mathematics and math teaching high, in high school. Um, and my mom similarly was pursuing the sciences. Um, but as Shirin mentioned, and I think and, I, and that, that was a, um, an excellent sort of primer on, on, on Iran history. Um, and the complexity of the revolution, right? That that many people who were support like on the streets marching, right? Um, after the revolution, a whole other reality sets into place. And of course, a war breaks out, right? So that's another connection to empire and US militarism. A major war breaks out between Iran and Iraq right after the revolution. And the war was uh, on, on, on the Saddam Hussein, Hussein side, supported by the United States. So is really like an Iran versus the world kind of story as the Iranian government is, is oppressing its own people. It's also fighting. And so there's this complex relationship. My parents, like many others in the diaspora, are resentful of the current Islamic Republic. Yet my father tells stories with a sense of pride about how Iran, even post-revolution Iran, 
defended itself from Iraq backed by U.S. and European countries. So that complexity is very much part of part of the way that, you know, I think we enter as as Iranians in the diaspora with roots, you know, being being, you know, ha having direct roots to the to the um, to the region. So for me, my journey into learning sciences comes from STEM education. So I come, my parents end up pursuing, they return to the U.S. to pursue advanced degrees in, in science and math. My dad, Ph.D. in mathematics, mom, Ph.D. in biochemistry. And so it's complicated even on that level, because as empire and militarism unraveled my part of the world, access to U.S. higher education allowed my parents and me as a young child to escape a war that eventually took, you know, a, a million plus lives. Horrific, horrific war. Um, and so I came, so STEM education was my entry into grad school. And then from there, once I got into grad school and started really thinking about the designing learning environments and doing my work with, you know, Oakland after school programs, boys and girls clubs, high schools, et cetera, was when I started getting introduced to the, to the science of the design of learning, right? How, you know, um, how to think about learning and it's in its relationship to culture and identity processes. So for me, learning sciences comes sort of after, um, you know, my entry into education via STEM. So that's, that's the kind of long, short version of how I come into the space. Yeah, and just to build on that a little bit, I appreciate that so much, Sepper. And I know that some of the mentors that that you encountered at Berkeley, we also share. And I see Chris there in the chat, so I also want to shout hey, Chris. out. Chris. Hey, Chris. Um, <laughs> and and I think actually Chris is a really important part of the story for me. Um, so just to like round out the like why learning sciences part, I. When I was 23, I was introduced to um, Chris through Manuel Espinosa, um, who was a graduate student in her space at the time. Um, and Chris was running a program for high school age migrant students um, who were the children of migrant farm workers from around the state of California, um, alongside Manuel, alongside Carlos Tejeda, three people who became my very dear mentors in that space. And that was a space that taught me that the world of, of um, caring about working with young people in education and these bigger kind of decolonial concerns could absolutely come together and in fact needed to come together. Um, and so I just wanna kind of shout out that space. And there's a couple of things I wanna say about that space that were really important to me, which is that I experienced the migrant program as a young person who was learning how to teach from the folks that I just named and others in that space. I see Pedro Nava here too. Um, uh, the, uh, was, as a young person learning how to teach in that context, um, I um, found a space that I trusted in the sense that these were folks with similar political critiques to my dad um, who intentionally were um, cultivating a kind of open and critical political education. And I mm -hmm. feel like the idea that um, of building learning environments where young people can learn how to critique but also learn how to dream and imagine and to do that in a way that was deeply attentive to their thinking and to their questions was really, really important to me. And part of the reason it was so important to me is because it wasn't just about what we were teaching, it was about how we were teaching and the how of learning. And for me, there's kind of a string between the how of learning and that experience of the revolution that my father and so many other people had, which is that without deep attention to the means, without deep attention to the how, there's more of a likelihood that we're gonna actually recre recreate those structures of power by a different name. Mm. And so when I read Freddy and I read Bell Hooks and I read these folks, I was like, well, these people are also wrestling with this concern. Like for me, Freddy doesn't always get recognized as somebody who is also um, in a critical dialogue with revolutionaries who are trying to use education instrumentally. And mm. he was like, no, no, we're not gonna use it instrumentally. It can't be the same methods towards different ends. It also has to be different methods. And obviously there's you know tensions and challenges with Freddy himself and his work that we can get into, but that was really important for me to encounter and to encounter a space that was bringing that alive. And the other thing that was really important to me about the migrant program was that the folks that I named who are doing really like imaginative, beautiful, artistic, political education in the classroom that I got to witness and learn from were also studying it. We're also video recording it. We're also taking field notes and we're spending the year between the summers like closely analyzing moment to moment talk and interaction 
the mediational conditions that made the kinds of thinking and becoming possible and the kinds of student sense making and the complexity and the layers of student sense making that were happening. And I was like, okay, this is <laughs> this is what it could look like to do this work in a way that's deeply attentive to the complexities that I wrestled with in my family that Sepper named. And, and that was what really brought me to learning sciences was not any sort of capital S science that was like a you know positivist version of that. And I still wrestle with that word, but was the deep study that young people sense-making in these kinds of learning environments deserves deep, careful, systematic study. That the mediational conditions and the tensions and possibilities of critical pedagogy, like the moment to moment details and textures of talk and interaction in environments of political education matter so deeply for us to be able to really try to understand in a micro way. And that was what kind of made me understand that there was a praxis at play, that research could be a kind of praxis that way, that is, is ultimately what led me to kind of go jump two feet in <laughs> with the learning sciences. I want, I want to thank you all for, for shouting out Chris, who's been influential to so many of us. So Chris, we love you. Definitely all the flowers in the world. Um, I want to lift up a couple of things that I, that I heard that I think are relevant to where we want to go. And we have five questions in mind. There's, there's probably no way we're going to get through five questions, right? Which is perfectly fine, but I, I'm loving the conversation and we can kind of meander um, as spirit moves us. Um, but what I want to, I want to, you talk about two, two feet in kind of jumping in, which is kind of what we've done. I want to take it a step back a little bit, okay? Um, and Saper, you were talking about this question of access, mm. right? And really the contradictions of, of access, right? In relation to empire and how empire is operating. And when we think about, right, taking a step back, whether it's my context within teacher education, trying to prepare classroom teachers and various educators who are stepping into the classroom to understand, uh, rethink what mathematical, scientific content, discipline, and literacies are. Okay, you also mentioned kind of Danny Martin, Danny Martin's work. I want us to think about for a second the importance of how we understand kind of scientific, mathematical, STEM disciplinary learning and kind of what that means. And so oftentimes, especially within a, a teacher education context, we, we talk about access, right? What marginalized young people need, right? What, what urban youth need, we need access. We need access to coding. We need access to various technical computational literacies. And that is dot, 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 right? And so I, I want you all to speak to your sense of how we can oftentimes talk about math, science, STEM in relation to educational justice projects and the importance of troubling these kind of tropes around access, right, for, for our young people, right, as this kind of panacea of all things, right? Let's have a, let's have a STEAM corridor in West Oakland to open up West Oakland, and that's what the young people need. OK, and so I want you all to kind of think about across the many different projects of your work locally. You all have both done a lot of work um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, but also just kind of nationally and, and internationally. Right. Speak to what does it mean? Right. To kind of rethink. This idea of a, of STEM education, of mathematical and scientific literacy and projects as a educational justice project. What what is at stake? Okay, how should we be understanding and reimagining, right, this work as an educational justice project? And I say this also, okay, when I was speaking right with Professor David Stovall, who's brilliant, his work is very interdisciplinary. I asked him to, what does it, what is your work, what does his work mean translatively to various communities like ours that maybe are coming into your talk, this talk, as practitioners? that want to be a science teacher, that want to be a quote unquote social justice math or science teacher. How, how, how should we be thinking about this and what's at stake? See, this is the question that I, I wish I got when there's like five minutes left so I could give like a preview and say, I wish I could have more time to get into it, but you know, um, we have to save it for next time. David, that's an excellent question. 
Um, and as you always do, you just, you know, you put your finger right on the, on the, on the point of tension, on the point of complexity. Um, and this is a very important and challenging question. I'll say a little bit about it. And I would love just to kind of honestly, you know, have a conversation back and forth. Um, because I have, I have mixed feelings about this whole, both, you know, the, the access project, but also the way we talk about the access project. So, um, I'll try to keep it bounded. Um, coming in, as I mentioned, coming into graduate school, I was definitely thinking about education, STEM education. My equity lens was an access lens for sure. Right. And so one of the things that I learned and one of the ways my, you know, my, my mind was blown and my, broad, and my horizons broadened was by um, expanding that frame and critiquing that frame and learning from a lot of the work that I was doing, not just as a graduate student in Berkeley, but with community groups in Oakland and the scholarship that I was reading, reading Flede, reading all the, you know, taking Zeus Leonardo's class, you know, being educated by Chris Gutierrez and Naila Nasir. I became much more refined, right? In, in terms of re realizing that you can't talk about equity and hold on to an access frame because what is STEM education outside of the neoliberal structures, bringing the, bring the military industrial complex and the relationships between access, right? In terms of educational access to high quality learning are inseparable from pathways that lead to US hegemonic influence, economic power, military power, et cetera. Also, you know, um, a person who's, who I saw in the room is Rick Ayers, that together the two of us have been talking about this. And I have to give a lot of flowers to Rick for, for kind of mentoring me and talking to me over the years and helping me understand how a critical STEM education project outside of the access paradigm is vital. And we've been, I've been learning and thinking with Rick um, uh, for, for many years. So, I think all, so we have to hold that and that, and that can't go anywhere. Um, at the same time, I want to mention another person in STEM education has been hugely influential in my own thinking, and then put it to the group in terms of how do we hold these things together, right? And he's Bob Moses. And Bob Moses, for those of you, um, uh, if, in case you're not familiar, civil rights icon, um, marched with Dr. King, led uh, SNCC with, Dr., uh, with, with Stokely Carmichael, um, you know, huge, huge role in the, in the civil rights uh, movement. Um, and in the 70s and 80s, his fight and his struggle took place in the context of math education. So he developed something called the Algebra Project. And as far as my understanding goes, the whole notion that, that math and science literacy, that the math and science education is a form of literacy, traces back to Bob Moses. And he was doing a direct link to the kind of discourse and symbolism and um, and, um, and and mindset of the civil rights era, right? So he drew that link and he created the algebra project, and he has been a, um, uh, a an extremely important voice in STEM education and equity discussions. And he passed away recently, uh, so I try to share his story as often as I can. And Bob Moses definitely had a justice frame. Right. In terms of his legacy, in terms of his life, in terms of his thinking. Uh, but we might argue that his approach in terms of math education might, if we were to kind of code it. Right. If we had a very brute coding system and the access paradigm was one and a more critical orientation was another one. He might fall. There could be a case for him falling into the more of the access paradigm. And I don't say that as a critique on Moses at all. As a matter of fact, I say that as um, from the place of I think there is a. There's a deep and important moral project within access that we have to hold on to as we expand and develop more critical imaginations around education. And I don't always feel like we we do that well as a uh, as a research community, as educators. You know, it's hard and it's not easy, and there's contradictions. And but at least that's kind of where, where I'm thinking about it. I've been thinking about this for for some time, but I'm just kind of stuck, right? I do believe. There, there is a tension and a contradiction. And, you know, the last thing I'll say about that is um, about the access frame. And I talk to, to, to Shane about this all the time. This comes up in, in our conversations all the time. Um, but one thing I can't let go of is that, you know, a lot of communities doing educational justice work disconnected from, you know, academy 
are, are oftentimes doing really, really foundational access work in STEM education. And yes, sometimes it, it lines up to the corporate agenda in ways it needs to get discussed and called out. But how do we do that without losing sight of what parents and communities are pushing for? And oftentimes that is you know, access to high quality foundational knowledge in algebra, in algebra two, in biology, in chemistry, right? Um, they're not, they're not um, disjointed from potentials of, of injecting more critical analysis into those, but that access to that knowledge is still critical. And we have to find a way to hold on to both. It's such a joy to be able to do this together because I feel like um, I so appreciate like the the path that Sepper just walked. And I feel like it allows me to walk this other part of the path. So I feel like we're like in a dialectic that way that that either one of us could have, you know, like gone on different parts of the path. But building on what Sepper said and appreciating your question, David, um, one of the things that I've been wrestling with a lot is how rigorous education gets defined. And I don't love the word rigor. The word rigor sucks, but complex, deep, um, high quality, you know, thinking about kind of what we want for our young people um, in terms of expansive academic and intellectual experiences in the context of STEM. How do we define that? And one of the things I worry about is that when we think about different discourses of equity, equity as access to STEM ed settled forms of STEM education. So to borrow from Megan Bang and Doug Medine, who have also you know, really shape this um, discourse in powerful ways. So access to settled forms of STEM education um, becoming defined as what is rigorous um, worries me. And I think it worries me because one of the things that happens through schooling, and I think we haven't talked very much yet about the differences between schooling and learning, but I imagine everybody on this call is, you know, worrying about that and thinking about that. One of the things that happens through schooling is a flattening of disciplinary learning that is actually out of touch with the dynamism and complexity and internal debates of disciplines in the world. And so there's this problem on the one hand of like, not just science and math, but literacy, social studies, civics, all of it getting flattened in a way that like a packaged version of it that's settled and untroubled in terms of the actual discourses that are happening at the edges of those fields among the practitioners of those fields doesn't make its way into our schools in ways that I think we can qualify as less rigorous. So I think that's that's a worry that I have on the one hand. On the other hand, and I think this is something I've learned from Sepper's work, there are important forms of political repression happening within those professional fields all the time. And we see that now with Palestine in spades, but we also saw it with Twitter. We also saw it with um, Google, Google, like we can go down the list, right? Of like who gets fired for raising what kinds of questions about empire, about you know extraction and the environment and what's gonna happen with AI, like all of it. And so I think that's a tension. And, I, and one of the things that I've really learned from Sepper's work is how do we support young people who are wrestling with these tensions? And so one of the things, other things that gets lost in equity discourses that are focused on access without a critique of disciplines and without an understanding of what disciplinary learning that meaningfully supports young people to think about the political and ethical values of our fields and the ways of knowing that we're being socialized into actually misses young people sense-making all the time. It's actually a flattened view of young people and the questions they have and the things they worry about. And so it's not very good pedagogy either <laughs> to, um, to teach these disciplines in a way that is divorced from the kinds of political and ethical questions that many young people have. And so I think that's another layer of complexity there. Um, and so um, I think about this in terms of, you know, going back to empire, like knowledge systems, what are the valued ways of knowing um, that would create kind of systems towards collective well-being and socioecological health. Like that, going back to how you started, John Fong, like that's a real question that we're wrestling with as a species. And so um, none of this is to say that folks that are working um, from a more traditional access paradigm are doing bad work. I don't think that's true. I think that's important to hold. But I think the conversation doesn't happen nearly often enough the possibility models about what STEM and mathematics and other forms of disciplinary learning could look like 
is not nearly as you know supported and advanced as other forms are. And so I actually have faith and believe that we would get to a different model of access, that access could mean access to this other kind of disciplinary learning if there was much more support for those conversations happening. And, and part of the reason I worry about this a lot is that I think living in the political moment that we're living in, we are also seeing the results of a DEI project that doesn't critique um, empire. We are seeing the results of um, a genocide that oftentimes is being supported by black and brown folks working in the Biden administration as the face of it. And I worry about that. And I think that that's a result of educational models that say, you know, access without critique. And I feel like that is a future that is also being built. Um, so I think that when I see, when I get called in to support like my own university or other universities to think about DEI, and I see that they have 11 principles, 15 principles, ways of thinking about inclusion and diversity, and none of it touches disciplines. None of it touches knowledge systems. That's, I can see like, okay, we're setting ourselves up for more of this. And I think it's really important to, to note that children and young people are already thinking in these ways all the time. And so when we don't actually support the more critical and imaginative possibilities around disciplines, it's a form of deficit thinking towards young people as well that we don't always name as such. This is kind of like kind of a unformed thought that will go into a new question. But you know, I think that Saper, your your question about access and empire being really bounding our thinking. The one thing that does give me hope that breaks me out of this thinking of whether, you know, are we supporting access, are we supporting empire, is when we take up some of the abolitionist um, calls, right? Or even when we think about, like, you know, if we're looking at climate catastrophe and we are really looking at possibly um, political, economic, and social, like, disintegration, right? What does it mean? to really imagine that science and math is something that we all need, right? Technology of some forms are gonna be things that we need after, right? So after empire, whether or not those are like violent changes or, or slow decays. So, you know, so this kind of leads to the next question, which is like, so if we were gonna imagine, so, okay, backing up, a lot of our critical pedagogies, right? Have really been based on and built against what we think of as schooling, right? So this is Shanine's right. kind of point. But what would it look like for us to reimagine math and STEM education beyond public schooling, beyond the state, beyond empire? What could it or should it look like? Really good questions. You guys are... Um making us work here this evening. And this is where we're like, oh no, these were not the exact ones that we came up with, questions. but we okay, can't okay. not ask it. A couple of things come to mind and these are gonna be very incomplete, um, a very incomplete response to, to that very excellent question. One point, picking up from where Shireen, you left off around, you know, um, a particular approach to STEM education that's dominant currently and settled that's in, that's in schools. If we're talking about schools for a moment. And, and the ways in which that, um, you know, glosses over at best the the the, comp, the, the complexity of how young people are, are thinking and 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 can, and becomes a form of deficit orientation. Um, I want to highlight that, right? And so that's actually I, like I was guilty of that deficit thinking in a project, and I think in a way that that's pretty um, productive for this conversation. So when I was wrapping up my dissertation in Oakland, I was working with an Oakland Technical High School. And computer science education was kind of just taking off uh, nationally as a, as, a, as a phenomenon. Now it's everywhere, right? Coding, CS education, state policy initiatives, but like really Obama, CS for all, um, coinciding with a lot of industry, getting involved, code.org, National Science Foundation. Um, it, it, beca it, it was this moment, very interesting, that I wrote about in my dissertation where, you know, reflecting back on it, what other educational movement is supported by the likes of you know, um, Obama and Trump and Nipsey Hussle and Chance the Rapper and uh, the, the the CEO of Northrop Grumman, right? Like all of a sudden, everyone's on the same page about this massive educational project, right? And so, which which clearly has deep ties 
to you know militarism and what's happening right now with AI, you know, that, that's deeply connected. And when I was doing my project in partnership with a high school teacher in Oakland, um, shout out Emmanuel on your door, um, we were designing curriculum uh, around having students think about applying the tools of computer science to different social cultural issues in their school. That was the kind of heart of the project. Meanwhile, this stuff was happening in the district. Intel was partnering with the school. Jesse Jackson was being brought in to sort of be the face of it, like literally giving a, a, an assembly to a room full of 2000, you know, Oakland tech teenagers telling them you must code. Right. And, he, and there's a whole, I've, many of you heard, have heard me talk about this. You know, you have to code. And, and, and he laid bare the logic of CS education as a project. Like the goal is Facebook. He, he's telling an auditorium of 2000 kids. And he's telling them to repeat after him. The goal is Facebook. And they're like, the goal is Facebook. I, I, like, the goal is Google. We will learn how to code, right? There's all this wrapped up into CS education. And at the time, here's where my deficit orientation came in. I was watching it all, taking my notes as a grad student. Um, but I, I wasn't tuned in to how the young people within the school, and, and in particular, the Computer Science Academy, might be thinking critically about the whole context, right? And, you know, the newsflash is that they were, right? There was another mentor, Rogers Hall, who made a comment to me around making a change in my design, my dissertation, to do some focus groups, to tap in. And, and that became one of the most interesting sort of findings in my work, unexpected from the initial design, was that it wasn't like a one particular homogenous critical view, but there was a diversity of uh, of viewpoints and there was a um, critical mass of students who were connecting the dots right and the dots they were connecting were tech industry silicon valley displacement oakland gentrification these same companies partnering with my school to push cs education what something doesn't something doesn't add up and i've completely you know i'm, I'm i wasn't thinking that they were thinking like that Right. And so what would it look like in hindsight to imagine as we think about AI education and CS education for, for it to be rigorous, but also expansive. Right. It's interesting. I think it would be very interesting to have a curriculum for high school students in the Bay Area. To learn about computer science. Along with the with the deep history of the way technology has transformed the entire San Francisco Bay Area and how Stanford University and Silicon Valley are inseparable. And the like, there's so much to get into there. And so I think, I think I'm just saying that to kind of, to agree with you, Shireen, that I think there's really, really, you know, starting with recognizing the expansiveness of youth thought, we can, we can take it much further. Um, Don Fung, your question around, which was, which was very difficult to answer, <laughs> but it took me to this place. I'm just going to drop the seat and I'm going to open it. I'm going to pass it back to, to you all. But when we think about to David's original question around, you know, how do we think about the broader project of educational justice, right? And we had, there is a question on our on our notes, our prep notes around parenting. And I've been thinking a lot. Um, I'm a parent, and I think a lot about education of the whole child. Thinking about my kids and all the different spaces they inhabit, and what I, what kind of cultural learning. Do I want certain places to do and not other places? What kind of political learning do I want some spaces to offer and not other spaces? Because not everyone is qualified to educate our children politically. Not everyone is qualified to educate our children culturally. And when we think about that in relation to the demographics of US public schools, the teachers and the adults in those schools and the kids in those schools, I think we have some hard conversations to have around the theoretical pieces of this, but how do we how do we tie that to the moment, right? And so I've talked about this with Shadeen a lot. This question of Palestine comes up, right? Where should the kids be learning about this? Is there a moral responsibility for schools to be talking about um, a situation that's taking over 30,000 human lives, majority of them civilian, majority of them children? Like, should schools be taking this up? Like, like I think just right off the bat, morally, yes. But right after we get past that, there's so many difficult questions. And I'll fast forward all the way to thinking about my, my oldest son is a first grader in a public school in Evanston. And he has a great teacher. She's a white woman. 
um, who I appreciate her for many, many different reasons for what she's done for my kid in the first grade. I would not feel very confident or comfortable for her talking about Israel and Palestine. Now, that's a problem in and of itself, because then what do you do when you have Palestinian kids and Jewish kids? And how does it you can't just not do anything. But I think there's a lot of work to do. And I'm not ready to say, yes, whatever plan you have, you, you, you know, you took a two week seminar on on militarism and the history of the Middle East. Now you're going to teach first graders about I get really nervous about that. Right. And I don't again, I don't know what the answer is, but I think that's just some of the complexity that I think we have to think about. Um, when we try to answer post empire, where does the work happen? What's the role of the home, the community, the school? You know, I think those are I think those are the questions that, that we should be asking. Yeah, just building on that a little bit, um, I really appreciate that. And I feel like um, connected to what you just said, Seper, I feel like um, there's a bigger conversation here about teacher learning um as a as a necessity of systems change and also like what are our models of teacher learning um and you know i know a lot of people on the call work on that deeply and i think obviously there's you know the demographic challenges of of who our teaching forces in comparison to who our many of our students are um and i and i think that um when it comes to teaching about these kinds of issues i think that um the more I work with educators and think about what educator learning can look like, the more I see it as a, you know, layered paradigm shifts and identity shifts that have to happen in terms of how people think about the world and politics, period, how people think about the, the practice of teaching, how people think about human learning, how people think about children and families, and therefore, like, how people think about their role with young people in learning environments. And so, it's a really deep and massive shift um, that has to happen that takes time and takes particular forms of mediation and conditions to create, um, to support that kind of teacher learning. So I feel like that's important. Um, weaving back to the question about what STEM um, education could be, um, I think that one of the ways that we might think about that is what does it mean to teach disciplines in a way that is always deeply tied to a critical intellectual history of those disciplines? And I think that young children, um, all the way up to our, you know, older students, um, not only can handle that, but I think are are deeply capable of and hungry for that kind of historicizing. Um, and I think that this is one of the ways that learning matters and feels connected to life. Like the other thing schooling does is routinely disfigure learning and mm -hmm. make it something that happens in school, but not connected to life. And that's just a disfigurement of what it means to be human and to learn. And so I feel like um, one of the ways to do that is to deeply connect disciplinary learning to their histories, which means their purposes. Mm. What we don't offer young people is a deep sense of purpose. And what we don't get to talk about when we only talk about access is the purposes of education and the purposes of learning. And I have, Sepra and I have both been in rooms where the second you raise the goals of STEM education, it starts to get us some deeper questions about the purposes of education and learning that I feel like we need to be having more broadly as a society. Um, and I think the other way to connect learning to life is to refuse the artificial separation of disciplines. Um, and I think you know many of us interact with young children, um, including our own. Young children do not think in terms of categories of disciplines. Um, I can't tell you how many times I saw my kid, and probably you all have seen your kids, like playing with water in a deep way that somebody could see as scientific, making up crazy mm -hmm. stories. You know, right. and just like the and and every every other story that you can imagine of how a deep kind of transdisciplinary learning is fundamental to human thought and learning already in mm -hmm. a way that school then um, categorizes. Like I see it with my kid because she's eight. Like before first second grade, she was not thinking in terms of like science over here, literacy over here. This also goes to the person who mm -hmm. asked about critical literacy. That's an enforced separation down right. to instructional time down to like we do science at 3 p.m <laughs> and and that is how you get a stem education that doesn't deal with civics 
that doesn't deal with language, that doesn't deal with how a phrase like natural resources is already embedded with all kinds of colonial and extractive assumptions. And so that's what I mean by an intellectual history of the field as you're teaching it is not just about its history, but about the history that it's making through its knowledge systems and through its discourses. So watching my kid remind herself to not use the word it, to talk about trees, to talk mm. about animals is one of the ways that I see her wrestling with language from a literacy perspective in a ways that matters for the kind of scientific learning and relationships with the natural world that she's engaged in. And that's what we miss. Like that is the rigor that I'm talking about that mm. we miss when we separate these disciplines and we treat young people as not capable of thinking in those terms when in fact they are often beyond because they're not already socialized into those settled ways of knowing. There's a deep opportunity, particularly with young children. And I feel like this is a push for our critical pedagogues too, myself included, that so much of our conversations about political education and critical pedagogy are, are with older students for good reason in lots of cases. But I feel like the folks that are trying to help us think about early childhood and elementary as spaces of deep political education matters here because I think there is something happening in children's thought that hasn't yet been socialized into these categories that is a place from which to build another possibility for disciplinary learning that feels really important. And the last thing I'll say is that one of the other things that I worry about is that because of our political conditions and because of the extent of repression, whether capital R or lowercase r, um, often we are positioned to push for the spaces to critique. Often we are positioned to argue for and advocate for even having the space with young people in schools to have these critical conversations. And that's important. But what I feel like we don't get to talk about enough is how we do that in a way that is nourishing to young people and how we do that in a way that nurtures a kind of radical hope and agency. Um, so one of the teachers I work with in Chicago, Tiffany Childress, um, used this phrase that I think is really important where she talked about the risks of pedagogies of despair. And I mm. feel like I appreciate her for that phrase and it's stuck with me ever since then because I feel like I wish that as critical pedagogues, we could have more of that conversation, which I think weighs on us emotionally and ethically all the time as political educators, but that we don't talk about enough, what does it look like? And so I feel like cultivating young people's sense of wonder, their sense of awe, and this goes back to like Megan Bang work and Carrie Zoe's work and folks that are that are thinking about this in terms of science education, like those are actually places for well-being, for intellectual but well-being and nourishment in the context of a political education that doesn't limit itself to critique, which is deeply important, but is not by itself healthy for young people and children. So I feel like that's something that I wrestle with and, and worry about. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I, I think this is a good kind of touch point for, and we're a bit out of order with questions, but it's fine. I think it's it's pertinent to the conversation where we're at. This idea of, of hopefulness, this idea of, of curiosity, right? Of wonder, of, right? This, this, you know, hopefulness as a discipline, as Mariam Kaba kind of talks about. Um, prior to this, Shireen, you sent us a lot of um, really accessible forms of, of your scholarship, right? From podcasting to, I think, really trying to contend with contemporary pressing issues um, such as Palestine, maybe in emergent kind of evolving ways, right? You know, particularly around this idea of wellness, for example. So Pear, you know, you talked about, you know, your upcoming book project, Revolutionary Engineers. I had the opportunity to hear from you last year at AERA, the, that particular job talk, and you can kind of clean up. I, I can't remember the, the the title. It was it was such a, mm -hmm. um, I think it was good for me to hear, right, outside of the discipline and kind of spurred my own kind of intellectual conceptual juices. And so I know, you know, you've talked about YPRT and those projects. What are some of the things that I think for, for both of you that you're really curious about, excited about, that you feel like is emergent kind of in your scholarship um, and, and really want to kind of sit with more? 
Okay, I can throw something out there since you referenced you. Thanks for the plug on my book. I appreciate it. Um, I told David to do that beforehand, by the way. Look, so good looking out. Um, um, so I want to share something with my about my book project that I think connects to, you know, as a way to answer your question, David, around something I'm thinking about. And I've been kind of throwing out different dilemmas that I'm wrestling with because I feel like we don't have that many opportunities. Even, you know, D Don Fung, you mentioned like Shinin and I, we we're next door. You know, in, our, in terms of our offices on Sundays, our kids are in the same Persian language school, but we get very little time. So this even this conversation is is I'm I'm using it as a as a way to kind of put out ideas that, that I'm thinking about um, at the edges of my thinking and dilemmas I'm I'm grappling with. So I want to share a brief story about my Iran project, but before I do that, I want to preface it by saying. The lesson, the lessons or implications of this of this story or dilemma are not easily transferable to the US context. So I don't want to tell the story and then and then and then some people get the wrong impression. Like, oh, so he's saying, no, I'm not saying that. Right. I'm I'm just sharing something that I've learned in my in my research that I think is, is useful to think about. And it gets at this question of the ethics of STEM, right? Which is something that we've been talking a lot about, and specifically in relation to empire and war and militarism. Right. Um, so one of our interviewees, we did oral histories and archival work for this project. And, and the basic premise of it um, is that in, in Iran, the most radical students are often engineering students, not always, but there's a trend, there's a cultural trend and association on college campuses between engineering students and political action and activity. Right. Something that's that's odd from a Western lens. Right. And so I was going into it to, to sort of understand um, understand that dynamic. And there's a really interesting history there also with efforts by particular Iranian thought leaders to um, to, to bring um, a deep kind of Islamic and um, even Iranian cultural sensibility to the design of this engineering school that is, some of you might know it, it's called Shadif University. It's, it's arguably the most prominent engineering school in the entire Middle East. Right. And it was started in the 60s by the Shah of Iran. But there's a lot. Of, so, this, so the book is really a story of this university and this activism of the university leading up until the revolution. Right. And so one immediate point of reference is that this school was started by the Shah, the U.S. backed Shah in the late 60s. Uh, it attracted the elite of the country. The technical elite and these elites then turned on the Shah and played a huge role and the successful revolution in 1979. Like, wow, like it was, that was a completely unexpected outcome for what the Shah probably had hoped for, right? Um, and so I say all this to say, there was an anti-imperialistic leftist student culture. I mean, even more than that. Let me, let me, not, let me not even um, water it down. It was a militant culture, right? So people were going and doing advanced calculus and linear algebra and programming. And then there were literally like learning how to sh use weapons and, and doing practice shots. And they, there was an assassination attempt by students. And it was a very politicized environment. Um, and one of the things that we were thinking that we would find is that because of the anti-imperialistic student culture and the leftist student culture, um, we were expecting to find more critiques around the, the association that the university had with America in particular. Why? Because this is this is in the, in the years leading up to the revolution where America was supporting the Shah because of the nuclear program. So there was a global strategic interest that American universities and American leadership were having in Iran and, and putting in all kinds of curriculum from MIT, bringing in the Western canon of scientific knowledge into this university of radical student protest. So my conjecture was, oh, these students, I bet we're gonna learn from the oral histories and from the archival work that they were part of their part of their activism was directed against you know hegemonic western curriculum uh, and the and the quick finding there is that it wasn't at all that the case in fact in fact the leftist students the militant students the anti-imperialist students were deeply suspicious of internal efforts by leaders to inject islam and certain cultural elements into a curriculum, they're like, no, 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 no. Give us, don't, 
You can't have an Islamic chemistry. That's a quote from one of my oral histories. Don't give me that water. Don't don't give me that. Don't experiment. I want the good stuff. I want the MIT. I want the best. Now, and I've been sitting with this for over a year. She didn't heard me talk about it millions of times. We, we, we can unpack that. One of the things that, 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 that comes to my mind, and it came up during an interview, when we're talking about militarism, and empire, and ethics, is that it's historically and, and, and nationally specific. So one of our, interview, one of our, uh, our interviews, this man said, okay, so you're telling me, post-revolution, Iran, the whole world is trying to occupy and invade and take our oil and invade our borders. And you're telling me that engineering faculty who are trying to build weapons to defend our borders, that's unethical? Says who? I'm a I'm a pacifist, you know. Like I'm like I, I'm coming at this like I don't believe in like the world of militarism and STEM, and 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 yet it's it it stopped me in my tracks a little bit, and it connects to what's happening, you know, right now in in Israel and Gaza. There's pictures right now on Twitter of a, of students at an Israeli university, I think in Tel Aviv, engineering students, posing with their new some new AI bot that's going to help the Israeli military easy to be like, for me, at least. Right. I think for many of us to be like, Oh my God, morally, that's so problematic. What's, how is that? You know, now if there was efforts by right Palestinians to develop their own science and technology that would aid in self-defense, don't we have to think about that in a different way? Ethically, I would argue we do. And I'm not saying, you know, again, don't jump to conclusions based off of this, but it's just, there's moments where even when we think about ethics and militarism and empire, who, how the how the ecosystem is, who the players are, what period of history, all really matter. And so I think that's a lesson that I'm trying to figure out how to apply right going forward. But it's it's like oh, like it all really matters. Um, so I, that's something that's that, that I'm that I've been really thinking about, David. And um, I'm still I'm still working it through. One of the things that I always appreciate about Seper and that I learned from you regularly is um, like, you know, Mike Rose was one of my teachers and and he used, in the context of writing, he used to, when we were struggling with something, he would say, write into the tension, mm -hmm. meaning like write the tension, don't try to resolve the tension and then write it. And I feel like Seper, you're really good at thinking in the tension. Like, I feel like you hold that complexity in a way that's a model. And it's part of what I think makes for an expansive political education with young people mm -hmm. is spaces that hold wrestling with that complexity that you're that you're engaging with in that project and that exists all the time in relation to these issues. And I feel like um, that's something that I just appreciate about your work and, and your thinking. Yeah. Um, and I feel like in that spirit, um, you know, some of the other things, I feel like I'm becoming a baby elder you know, and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, um, looking at, you know, 20 years of like le different learning environments that I've gotten to be in and learn from and contribute to and kind of thinking about like, what have I, what am I holding? What am I understanding about um, human learning and political education in these ways? And I feel like um, the space to wrestle with that kind of complexity with support um, is really important. I also feel like I see more and more how important it is for young people to have access to learning environments where process is embraced and where revision is an ethic. And what I mean by that is like educators who model revising their thinking, sometimes within a sentence, like saying something and then being like, ah, I don't know about that word I just used. Let me try again. And the kind of the kind of thinking and um, kind of um, care for one another that emerges in that kind of environment is something that I feel like is really important. I feel like our systems are really adept at creating learning environments in schools where vulnerability is to be avoided at all costs. And add to that, you know, racialization, gender, um, class, you know, other categories of hierarchies, and and really like, you know, Ray McDermott used to say schooling is a game of not getting caught, not knowing and getting caught knowing. And I feel like that's that's that world of like, don't get caught being vulnerable and not knowing. And I feel like 
um, justice oriented learning environments make the felt experience of that kind of vulnerability a positive experience of learning with others. And so I've, I'm really curious about that. I think a lot about that. And the, and the piece at the edge of my thinking that I um, am holding now with that timeline of my own kind of pro process is what opens up for young people over longer arcs of time through those kinds of experiences and what happens when those experiences are not aberrations but are sustained and multiple. And I feel like our field is not very good yet at studying outcomes, quote unquote, over longer arcs of time. And I think about this in relation to the migrant program, like many of our students went on to become educators. And I think about that a lot. I think about the young people in our program at Northwestern for first gen low income students and the ways that they go on to build other spaces. And so mm -hmm. I think a lot about this idea of sister spaces and like the spaces that grow from spaces mm -hmm. through people as another way to see learning. That's a collective way to see learning, but it's also a long, long term way to see learning that I think about a lot. And I feel like there's a lot for us to learn through those views. And I think probably the students that we all have long term relationships with, like we see, we see how those experiences um, take shape over time. I had a student tell me that that program at Northwestern, which was modeled after the migrant program, he said um, after you know a couple years of being post-graduation, that experience is still unraveling for me. And it was such a powerful phrase because I thought like, wow, like this thing, this experience we had together continues to have life. And I think that um, the other layer of that for me that I find really important in relation to our conversation about STEM education and disciplinary learning is what those kinds of learning experiences mean for young people's relationships. Relationships with each other, relationships with family, relationships with you know, other educators in the world. Like I feel like that is the other deeper piece of human development that we don't talk about. What is a disciplinary learning that creates healing relationships um, is, is a question that we don't get to ask because we tend to have a system that separates the cognitive and the academic from the emotional and the ethical and the relational. And I feel like those deeper experiences of learning that many folks here are cultivating are about that kind of wholeness, but also what it makes possible over time. So my kind of um, uh, project that similar to SEPA is connected to Iran is uh, a new project where we're actually interviewing um, elder Iranian leftists about their own political consciousness and specifically asking about what it meant for how they raise children. And mm -hmm. then talking to their children and trying to understand how having parents who were politically active in that way influenced their upbringing and what it means for how they're raising their children. And that's part of what I mean by the, this longer arc of like intergenerational learning. And I feel like when we look at something like the revolution, people often, and globally as well, people often talk about like the failure of the left or the way that the revolution failed. And I feel like there's truth to that in terms of some of the political outcomes. But when you look at those longer arcs of intergenerational learning and what people's children and grandchildren are doing and how they're mothering and fathering, and raising children, it feels like there's something more for us to understand about what these kinds of educational experiences mean over time. I think I, I want to make sure we get a little bit of audience kind of question and voice as well. And I think this is actually a really good segue. Um, so Don Fung kind of highlighted uh, one particular question, which is which is asking us to think about um, right. So for the question for the how do we think about human learning and political education in spaces where students and or communities, parents are traditionally seen as perhaps more conservative, right? Mm -hmm. So how are we thinking about that and, and how to navigate that type of thinking and praxis? That's a good one. Um, that's a great one for a conversation with, with, with all of us too. I know we all, I have a, I have a, um, one of the kind of most um, poignant incidents I've had in a classroom was when I was at when it, at USF, and there was a military student, um, you know, kind of well-meaning, but the comments were increasingly volatile and offensive, and had to had, there, there was intervention that happened. I don't remember the details, but I remember it, it stood out. Um, I think that 
I don't have the answer to this question. I think it's a really important question. My quick reflection on it is that um, there's, there's probably a lot of different viewpoints and disagreements, right? That, you know, you know, I think like, what do we do? We're in 2024, half the country is pro-Trump. Some of those students are in our classes. You know, we, we're going to get conservative students in our classrooms. What is our responsibility as educators? I think that's an important moral question. Others, others might say, that's not my project, and I respect that as well. And and people focus on you know where they focus, educationally and, and politically. But I, I think I pro I probably agree with the statement that that we should be having a conversation, given where this country is at, given the stakes, given the the political friction and the inability to have conversations. And as as a field of education, right? We're not just in San Francisco and Chicago and Oakland, right? This is a big country. So if we're think if we're having that conversation and we, we have to be attending to what does it mean for um the kids, the, the young people who are in classrooms who have what, what some of us might view as very conservative even ideas, right? On issues that we on on that we have strong opinions about. What do we do with that? I don't, I don't think we have an answer to that. And I, I think my comment is just that, like, we should be talking about that. And I don't, I don't have a good answer, but I think it's an important, it's a really important thing that's probably not talked about enough. So I appreciate the question. Shireen, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the complexity of this question. I think the only things I would add is I do think it raises the question sometimes of who um, does that work, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes I feel like I, I will get read a certain way doing that work in certain communities that somebody else might be more effective at than me um, in certain ways. So I think that's an interesting question to me. The other thing, thing that's interesting about our political moment is that I think I want to complicate the idea of conservative areas. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's a lot of heterogeneity in a lot of places that we might assume to be conservative. And I, and I actually think, you know, part of the backlash around, you know, this boogeyman of critical race theory and all the anti-woke stuff that's happening is about a, a generational divide among conservative communities too. And about people seeing their white children march for George Floyd and not knowing what to do with that. And so I think it's important to also hold that um, there are real complex conversations happening within families and communities that I think sets us up differently to think about the work with young people and what they're holding and navigating than only like they're conservative and how do we teach them to think in deeper ethical ways about the world. So I think that's important. And then I feel like um, there's some uh, strategies pedagogically that I think are important. Like one of the things I try to do in my classroom is shift from, um, you know, people, when people express a more conservative idea and I have the reactions that we all have probably internally and I try to figure out like, what is my role as a pedagogue at this moment? And it's often to treat it as an idea mm -hmm. and not treat that person as the bearer of that opinion and to take it into the realm of like, this is an idea that exists in the world and it's a dominant ideology and let's look at it. And so I think that's one kind of strategy. And I think the other thing going back to the conversation about disciplinary learning is that some of the routine practices and ways of knowing in our disciplines are not helpful for this. And one of those that I've noticed a lot is that um, we teach young people that the way to engage with text and the ways to engage with each other in political discourse is to agree or disagree, to agree or disagree with text and to agree or disagree with each other and to deal with what are assumed to be fixed and fast opinions. And so when students get to me in college, like one of the first things I try to do is um, teach the ways of engaging with text and ideas that are um, far outside of agree or disagree and work with the meaning for much longer. And so I feel like getting into a space with students um, to work with meaning in a way that doesn't jump to some formation of opinion right away or that way of thinking about like debate and kind of this, this really American, I think, way of thinking about politics, um, I think is necessary to get into thought space with people that actually has the power to move um, so away from some of those more dominant ideologies. I think the, the pedagogical kind of tools are, I think, are really helpful. I think it's also a philosophical question, right, mm -hmm. in terms of how we understand. So, for example, the scope of work as a as a teacher, right? And what I mean by that, right, Shady, you talked about 
the this kind of longer arc of learning, right? Which is kind of a temporal question. We need to kind of have that sense. I also think we need to have a, a longer relational arc in terms of how we understand the scope of our work as educators, right? Mm -hmm. And so rather than this kind of false binaristic setup, parent community versus schools and teachers, what is the educator responsibility, right? To also understand, right? Our relationship to parent and community, right? As, as a part of that educational teaching and learning ecosystem. And I think one of the things that all parents understand very early, right? Is that who your young, who your children's peer group is, is gonna directly impact, right? How you need to respond in terms of your parenting and socialization, right? right. So said a, said a different way, right? Who you are essentially parenting, right? Your young people's friends as well. And your young people's parents are parenting your children as well. That's right. And so it's a different expansive relational shift. Mm -hmm. I think we have to take a little bit more seriously, right? To think what is my obligation and responsibility, right? To a different set of relations, i.e. parents and community, right? So I know we wanted to throw in a question around kind of parent as well. Um, so I, I think I, I wanted to make sure we, we invoke that. Okay. Yeah, can I just say something to that, David, that I feel like I so appreciate that you went there because one of the things that we're missing right now is um, strategies for responding to parental pa pressure that's coming from a powered place that is pedagogical, mm -hmm. that is coming from an expertise around young people and teaching. Like when you think about, you know, pro-Israel families putting pressure on school, like the response is to fold. Mm -hmm. It is not to teach. And I feel like it's, it's not an easy thing to teach, but we don't even have the conversation about how to teach. And I feel like that's that's part of what's missing in talking about this type of strategy. Mm -hmm. So we did have a question about parenting, but I do have a sense that there you guys kind of touched on it in different places and I am watching the time. David, what are, hey, no. Perfect, that was perfect David, right we there. Were talking I, I, about parenting. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to go to the kind of outro or should we throw out the parent question? No, I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's, it's 720, 729. Uh, night is young, but not as young. We got to make sure young, young. Young. we can continue uh, on, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I think, um, I think we can continue this conversation. Um, would love to definitely in maybe another shape or form continue to to con continue this conversation with you all, Shireen and Sapir. Um, but I think we want to just first really extend our gratitude um, for you all, um, for your partners and family, right? That also just allowed you to have the space as as parents, right? To even be with us um, during this time. And so um, Northwestern is is super super. Um, lucky to have you all. We were super lucky to have you for this evening. Um, and so we want to, you know, continue just, just to being in community with you all and your ideas moving forward. And we we hope that's also reciprocated. So um, I want to make sure folks folks are able to kind of check out your faculty pages, your sub stacks, your Twitter, Twitter handles, just to kind of um, learn more about your work and ongoing and future projects. I want to thank Don Fong for helping to curate this experience and, and everyone who was able to zoom in um, and learn and continue these conversations alongside of us. Um, um, I think if you're not connected with see her and, and the work that we're doing at the center, just please make sure you check out our various communication channels, website, email list, social media, um, our future book project, Crafting Home Place, Sapir's book project, Revolutionary Engineers. Um, Shireen, I know, has a book project also coming coming soon. Um, so just kind of look for all those things. And um, that's all that I have to say as well. No phone? That's it. We would, I mean, that was an ex a really wonderful and rich conversation. And I hope that those people that were able just to kind of peek into it um, got something out of it. But thank you. It was lovely. Nice. It was lovely. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, y'all. Well, I think that concludes our conversation for this evening. Um, wherever you will be this evening and this weekend, please uh, do it with care. And we look forward to um, our next conversation with folks. I think we, I think we got your, your, your outro music to pair. Outro. Uh, we did want to that? find out about why you picked those, but. That, that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. Hey. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Enjoy the children. I don't, I don't hear it. They hear it. We don't, don't hear it. it. We don't, don't we don't hear, hear it. it. 
Okay, let me put it up on my own phone so I can be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Good Good thanks, y'all. All right, we'll, we'll check in soon. Peace. All right, peace. All right. I'm not sure what happened to the outro song, but that's all good. And then is someone closing the room?